Um, so my name is Sean McKenna, and I am the director of the Division of Hydrologic Sciences at DRI, Desert Research Institute. And I'm just going to be walking you through a bit of an overview of what DRI is today. And then <clears throat> I thought I'd focus on uh, four different projects, some example projects that we're doing right now. Very good. And uh, I don't know if we've got any hydrologists in the crowd today, but uh, we'll, we'll try to keep this at a fairly high level, um, talk about what we're doing. So uh, I think as most of you know, um, Desert Research Institute is here in Nevada, and we've been here for about 60 years. And there we go. We are part of NSHE, which is the Nevada System of Higher Education. And that includes UNR, TMCC, UNLV, the community colleges, some other campuses. So we are one of the eight institutions. We do not grant degrees. We are the research institute with, within NSHE. That said, we work very closely with um, the universities and colleges. As I said, we've been here for about 60 years. We have about 400 scientists, engineers, students, and support staff. And that includes about 100 PhDs in more than uh, 40 different disciplines. Our um, funding last year was about 39 million in sponsored uh, research uh, grants. And that's, that's been fairly steady for the past few years. What we do, DRI is divided into three different um, divisions. That's atmospheric, earth and ecosystem sciences, hydrologic sciences, and then we have a, a smaller group, not a division, but a group that works with uh, education and workforce development. Over the past, uh, I'd say three, four, maybe even five years, there's been a considerable change in the senior leadership at DRI. Uh, myself, I've just been here a little bit over a year. And um, part of that change has resulted in us coming up with a new strategic plan and you can see right here, vision, mission, core values, and we'll read through all of those, but just a few points on this. We very much envision a world in which trust between science and the public is, is core. I mean, that's something that has to be there. That is something that's been really difficult and getting more difficult in the US over the past, you know, I don't know, five or 10 years. That's something we want to help um, change. We are a home for science to create a better future for Nevada and other areas. And I think when you look at some of the problems on the environmental side that are facing the nation right now, whether that's water or wildfires, uh, climate could be um, droughts as well. Nevada is really front and center on facing a lot of those issues that, that are also facing the rest of the country. But I think it's maybe more acute and more immediate here in Nevada and it's a challenging place to be, but it's also a great set of challenges to work on here at DRI. And then at DRI, we certainly want to have the best possible team that we can. And that means hiring the best people. And that means coming from a diverse set of backgrounds, bringing a diverse set of perspectives and views uh, to the science that we do here at DRI. So a little bit on that uh, strategy that's been updated just recently. Um, we've got more than 40 different uh, labs and facilities. We do a lot of field work as well. You can see some of the examples there on those slides. It'd be great to have people up here to tour through those, uh, but we can't do that just yet. Uh, we work locally here in Nevada, here in Reno and Las Vegas, across the state, across the West and internationally. Uh, you can see a few things on here. We spun up very quickly last year, a project to look at COVID in uh, wastewater streams, um, not from big cities, which was already being done, but from rural communities to identify incidents of COVID by using the wastewater as an aggregator for that. Uh, that's an example. Um, this is work at uh, Devil's Hole, uh, getting a temperature survey and, and microbial uh, ecology of Devil's Hole uh, in Ash Meadows in Southern Nevada. We uh, work all over the world, done projects in about 100 different countries on all continents. Uh, you can see a few examples there, um, things that are in some cases are, are very similar to what we face in Nevada, um, the aridity and wildfire in Australia to places that are quite different, um, using things that only exist in certain places like the ice cores that come from uh, Greenland. 
So just a little bit on each division then, I think atmospheric sciences, we are very strong in atmospheric chemistry and understanding uh, particulates and their reactions in the atmosphere. Uh, fire sciences obviously is becoming a, a bigger part of that. Earth and ecosystem sciences, a uh, lot of biology happens there, a lot of human history and systems, the anthropology and archeology span that's necessary uh, for creating new projects uh, within the state. Um, and then a lot of geoscience do a lot of work with soils and properties of soils and how to measure those uh, without actually having to touch them. Um, in hydrologic sciences, we really focus uh, still groundwater, surface water, their interactions. We've got the uh, ice core lab here in our division as well. We also do quite a bit of microbiology. And I'll talk just a little bit at the end about some of the uh, human health work that we're starting to do. If you are at all involved in K through 12 education within Nevada, you are probably aware of DRI's uh, green boxes. Green box science kits are uh, basically green suitcases that we mail out to uh, teachers within the uh, educational system that have pre-made experiments and lessons in them. And uh, those were extremely popular during COVID. Um, good way to get the uh, science out to those that need it. We, as I said, we do not grant degrees, but we work closely with the graduate programs in atmospheric sciences and hydrologic sciences. At UNR and UNLV, we uh, have faculty that teach in those programs, advise graduate students in those programs. And we also do that at other NG institutions. Uh, one that I'll be pushing a little later is our citizen science program. We wanna get as many people involved in that as possible. And talk a little bit about how we can do that. And we also have a number of outreach uh, events that we provide both in Reno and Las Vegas. So that's a little uh, overview of DRI, um, uh, all three divisions, plus our Office of Education. Here's just a set of logos of the sponsors that we rely on and that we work with uh, for funding the, the projects that we do here at DRI. And a lot of uh, federal agencies on there, but also a number of uh, commercial agencies and nonprofits. And we are able to work with all of those quite effectively. So what I'm gonna do is just go through um, four example projects that we're working on now. And um, I'd be happy to stop at the end of each one of those and just see if there's a question or two. If not, we can... Uh, move on and I'm happy to ask, answer uh, questions at the end as well. So four of those, we'll look at uh, wildfires and um, new term for me at least, and one I'm pushing, wildfire hydrology. Uh, how we're using ice cores to better understand um, ancient societies and how those may parallel some of the challenges we're facing. We'll look at microplastics, um, where they come from, where we find them. And then a set of tools that we've created with a number of partners over the last few years to help uh, manage water uh, better, mostly in agricultural settings uh, using satellite information. Okay, wildfire hydrology. This one's a little longer than the other examples and there's three pieces here. One of those is understanding droughts. So if you think back five or 10 years ago, we thought about droughts in a way that was all on the supply side, right? It hasn't rained in a week or a month or six months, we're in a drought, right? And that understanding has really been changing over the last decade to shift to the demand side of that or the balance between supply and demand. And the demand is really the, the atmospheric thirst. How dry is the atmosphere and how much water is that able to pull out of the land surface? Right, so droughts now are, are just not the lack of precipitation, but also the aridity of the atmosphere and how much that impacts the land surface. So talk about that a little bit. Um, some monitoring of fires, how do we do that? What are we interested in measuring within those fires? See a picture of some folks doing that right there with a drone. And then as we go through after the fire, what does a fire do? Uh, to the hydrology of a basin, right? So we certainly see changes in soil properties. Those changes impact um, sediment, nutrients, and, and water flowing out of that basin. 
All right, this is uh, part of the team that's worked on the uh, drought components and see some of the DRI folks there along with partners at uh, NOAA and uh, a couple other locations, several universities that actually are down here worked on this as well. And I'll just talk about something called uh, EDI, okay? Evaporative Demand Drought Index. It's basically a measurement of that atmospheric thirst. How, how arid is the atmosphere and how uh, capable is that atmosphere of pulling water out of the uh, land surface from the soil? And as you might guess, that uses uh, or depends on things like temperature, the wind speed, uh, sunshine hitting that location and humidity among other things. So we started working on this uh, probably about five, six years ago. Um, and again, droughts really didn't take into account the aridity of the atmosphere. So this was kind of a new piece. Um, we uh, around that time started working with Google and Google's Earth Engine as a partner and have built a tool on, on top of Google Earth Engine that's called Climate Engine. And you can go check it out here. Uh, you can see the uh, the uh, address for that. And on that, we are now able to show a lot of different climatic uh, and environmental data and the things that we calculate from that, such as eddy. So in this case, high eddy values right here, looking at very um, arid conditions. You can see in this case, drought over the US, Southwestern US. This was, trying to find that, looks like this was back at the end of uh, February. Other places on the earth experiencing uh, much more humid conditions and not, not having to worry about that part of the drought. So we've made this available. I think if you have a Google Earth Engine account, which is free, you can go on and play with this. Um, and this is something that we see as a way to better communicate with our sponsors and our stakeholders on problems uh, that they are facing. This gives them direct access uh, to the data and to the uh, calculations that we're doing. Now, going back again, um, the U.S. has had a, a series of drought indices for a number of years, probably 10 to 15 years now. And again, those were really not capturing um, the aridity of the atmosphere. We've combined eddy into um, some of these different indices, and these are now part of the, um, the U.S. drought indices that are put forth every uh, every few weeks or every week in some cases. So this was, I think this is the most recent one I grabbed the other day, not quite a month ago, and you're looking at um, drought categories for the U.S. across here that we've calculated. Those have been um, integrated into the more official drought monitors that is released by uh, NOAA and the USDA, and these are used to um, basically identify the severity of droughts and the length of droughts in different areas. And that's used for federal aid that's given to ranchers and farmers if there's a bad growing years. So that's one thing that, that has kind of started at DRI. We've made an outlook for that both um, to the general public, people who want to use that, as well as integrated that into um, some of the federal drought indices uh, with our partners. Oop, oh, sorry. Getting of myself. Um, just a little bit more on that, um, that eddy, that um, evaporative demand changes over time. And I'll go into that in a second. This has really had some impacts on what we used to think of as the fire season, or we still do. And if you <laughs> remember nothing else from this talk, maybe this is a good one to, uh, to keep in mind. From the 1970s until you know, through the 2010s, so about 40 years there, the length of the wildfire season has grown by more than three months. I think it's somewhere over 100 days. And there are now parts of the West and the Southwest in particular where talking about a fire season really doesn't make a lot of sense anymore because it's just continuous, right? We, I think in Southern California, we had fires last December, right? And that's not something we would have run into 20 or 30 years ago. This is just an example of how these eddy measurements uh, change. This is Boulder, Colorado, and you can see a, a big fire occurred in the summer, as we would expect. We also had a very big fire, sunshine fire in March of 2017. Again, not something we would have expected previously. And there was an extreme evaporative demand or extreme eddy at that point. Okay. Um, 
but we're talking about fires, right? So what does this mean for fires? So being able to forecast or estimate that evaporative demand not only dries out the soil and the surface of the earth, but is also drying out the fuels that might be lying on the forest floor or on rangeland. And I think I don't think that's too big of a stretch. You can see that we've got you know, some data that shows that that is in fact the case. Right here, as you're seeing that evaporative demand goes up, the, um, the uh, percentage of moisture in the fuel, moisture content of the fuel is going down. So here from 10% to 6%. And it's a little hard to measure, get a lot of measurements of fuel moisture, but in the cases where we've been able to do this, that is the case. Um, so we're drying out um, the land surface, we're drying out any fuels that are on the floor or on the land surface. And that's uh, just at that point just takes some ignition, right? Lightning strike or spark from something to get us into um, situations where we got fairly fairly intense fires. All right, so just a few pictures here. Um, there's a movie here. I was going to play that, but I, I think I'll let you find that on your own. Um, there's was worried about the sound and the quality of the video going across here. Uh, just a few things that DRI is doing here. We've had a program for a number of years looking at larger level atmospheric um, conditions and how those might move fires and how they might move the smoke that come off of those fires. And that works well. This is a satellite image that gets coupled with very large scale atmospheric models. And we provide that service um, through the Western Regional Climate Center. What's come up more recently is this idea of using uh, drones, right? So you can see a couple of our drones here. I think we've got six or eight drones in the fleet now at DRI. This was at a, a large experimental fire um, with the Forest Service and the EPA and a number of uh, universities as well. And a couple of things um, became clear very quickly. One is the drone pilots are used to <laughs> being able to see the drone. And it's usually within line of sight and be able to see off of the drone from the cameras what they're flying over and through. And you can't do that when you're in a thick smoke cloud. So this took some um, additional skill on the, on the part of the drone pilots to be able to figure that out, to be able to fly these drones through fairly dense uh, smoke plumes coming off of these uh, wildfires. And that, uh, if you watch that video, you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that. Now, why would we want to fly a drone into a uh, wildfire? Which is a good question. So what we've really um, invested heavily in here at DRI and have become fairly expert in is building custom design sampling systems um, that can fit on these drone platforms and sample different elements of the smoke of the uh, wildfire itself, um, and then bring those samples back to the lab for analysis. And this is, some of this has been quite uh, interesting. So we'll get into this in a moment with the, with the hydrology as well. Smoke is made of, of different things and of many different properties that we hadn't really figured out before these samplings. One of those is that uh, microbes, microbiological organisms actually can exist on soot particles coming out of smoke and can be transported fairly far distances on that smoke um, in, in a live state. So doing the biological sampling, this was run by one of our colleagues at the University of Idaho, really proved that these microbes were attached to the smoke particles and able to transport themselves quite a ways. And we built the uh, sampling systems uh, for that and flew those. Another piece um, that we've been working on is infrared imaging of fires. So <laughs> this quickly became uh, very useful when we started flying into these dense plumes of smoke Infrared allows you to see the fire, the heat basically, through that dense smoke plume and uh, understand where is it moving and, and how quickly and in what direction. So if you think about sampling smoke previous to this, you were either using an airplane very high above it, or you had some uh, stationary samplers and you hoped that the smoke or the fire went past them. Now we can actually track the fire, fly through it, sample where, where and when we need to within that. So that's been a, uh, a big piece of work over the last few years. Let's get to the hydrology part, okay? <laughs> Third part of, the, of this. Um, fires drive changes in soil properties, and we don't really understand how that happens yet. Um, 
does a fast moving but very high temperature fire create the same changes in the soil structure as a maybe less um, high temperature or lower temperature fire, but one that doesn't move nearly as quickly over the, over the ground? Uh, that's the kind of um, questions we're asking right now. This is a nice example of what the soil structure in this location looked like before it was burned, and you can see that kind of popcorn uh, texture to the soil. And this is post burn, right, where it just looks like a pile of sand. Um, so fire has a significant effect on soils. And what you see here is this idea of uh, basically fusing or building a crust um, on the maybe the top inch of the soil, and that's hardened uh, during the fire and while the soil underneath the, is, is still loose. Um, so that's another way that the soil uh, structure changes. How long does it take to get back to something that looks like this? Really, that's an open question, the one that we're starting to look at now. And what are the, the key uh, factors that drive that change from post-burn back to uh, a more normal, healthy looking soil? It's also um, drives the question of how permeable is this soil after the burn relative to what it was pre-burn? And I can tell you in a lot of cases, most cases, it's, it's not very permeable at all. And that becomes a problem because if you get a large storm after a burn on a less permeable soil, we tend to not get any infiltration. That water goes down the basin, becomes very erosive and becomes in many cases, mudslides or debris flows like you see here uh, moving into this house. Um, very difficult problem to, um, <laughs> to take care of after that happens. So we're working on um, developing techniques that can under, help us understand those changes in permeability. A very simple one that can be done in the field immediately after the fire is just a drop test. So we put a drop of a certain size onto that soil and just look uh, basically time how long it takes for that to soak in. You get up to about 10 minutes and it hasn't moved, it's telling you that that soil is not permeable at all. We do similar experiments in the laboratory um, on sands where we can control the grain size and the composition of the soils to check that. And the end result of this is looking at the uh, re water repellency of that soil and how can we put that into a predictive model um, like you see here. So how much of that rainfall is going to infiltrate versus runoff and how much water will be in the channel when that happens. This is a project where we work very closely with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, and uh, we'll continue to work on that over the next few years. You can see a few uh, papers that were published on that down here. There's also a nice uh, blog right up in that, um, in that link. So some simple tools, uh, and then moving to some more complex tools that allow us to um, better predict the state of that uh, basin and the behavior of that basin after a wildfire. So that's a little bit on what we're doing in wildfire hydrology. All right, we'll move on to the next example. So we're gonna go from, uh, we're gonna go from fire to the other end of the spectrum to ice. Um, so a little bit of background on this. Uh, we've had a strong presence um, looking at glacial ice here at DRI uh, for more than 30 years. Um, I was actually a graduate student here getting my master's in the late 80s and uh, Ken Taylor was running our ice program at that time. Um, and that has shifted directions, but we've still maintained that expertise. Joe McConnell runs our ice lab now um, and he's been working here probably for 20 years or more. So the overall goals here are to develop efficient leading edge chemical measurement techniques that we can use to understand what is in glacial ice and then use those to create the most detailed long-term environmental records available. So if you think about a glacier, uh, the reason it's there is because it gets more snow during the winter than it melts during the spring and the summer, right? So that snow accumulates uh, some years more than others. And it's kind of like looking back through a set of tree rings, right? You understand, um, years where it was wetter and there was more snow and years where it was drier. Um, Greenland, Antarctica, a number of other places are, are 
areas where you can find very thick glaciers that not only tell us how much snow every year, how much um, how wet or dry it was, but they also archive what was in the atmosphere when that snow was deposited. So if you think about uh, maybe a pollutant or something like that, uh, that got up in the atmosphere um, and was deposited with the snow, traces of that will still be in that uh, ice core. And that's what we want to pull out and be able to identify and look at how those vary over time uh, using the equipment that, that we've got in the ice lab. As an example, uh, one of the studies that Joe and his group have done is have looked at different isotopes of lead that were deposited in the snow that came from the Romans smelting coins uh, many hundreds of years ago in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. Now, how do we do this? This takes a little bit of uh, ingenuity here. So, first of all, you go somewhere cold, like, like you were just seeing, camp out on the glacier. Um, most of this work has been funded by NSF, and NSF has a National Science Foundation. NSF has a very uh, strong team of uh, people who do the logistics and able to do the drilling. So this is drilling down thousands of feet into the ice and pulling out a uh, core. It's about maybe six inches in diameter, something like that. Those are obviously kept frozen um, and brought back to the lab. And we store them here in our uh, DRI ice core lab and uh, storage uh, facility. So like I said, the focus is on aerosols that were linked to different climate related processes. And so the aerosols that were transported around the atmosphere and then deposited with the snow are what we're looking at. And then can be indicative of a number of different things. When that ice core is taken and then comes back to our lab, what you're seeing here looks like a square uh, piece of ice. And that is exactly what it is because what happens is the sides of that round core are cut away. We're left with the inner square part. And that is done in a way that anything that might have adhered to the outside of that ice core during transit or even pulling it up from the borehole is not going to become part of our sample. Okay, so though now we're working with a square ice core. And what's going on here is that's being slowly melted using a set of uh, lights here to provide the heat. Uh, you see a bit of duct tape there. There's no, no good lab project without some duct tape. And the meltwater from that is being funneled into two uh, parallel mass spectrometers. And each one is tuned to either kind of the lighter end of the periodic table or the heavier end of the periodic table. And we're able to identify or, or analyze that for about 30 to 40 different uh, elements. And this runs continuously. So that ice is being melted and we're getting a continuous reading of the different elements that were entombed in the ice. Now, the resolution on this, um, the depth resolution is less than a centimeter. In terms of snow thickness, that's annual to subannual time resolution. The uh, resolution on the detection or the analysis of these different elements can get down to in the area of one part per quadrillion, right? So that's what you see there. And it's always hard to visualize, oops, exactly what that is. But I did the calculation last night. <laughs> Lake Tahoe's got about 36 cubic miles of um, water in it. It's a deep lake, it's a big lake. If you dropped a teaspoon of a dye or a tracer into that, that would be one part in a quadrillion. Okay, so a teaspoon within Lake Tahoe, that's the resolution that we're working with for detection or, or detection of an addition of something at that level. I'll put a plug in here too. Any businesses that are looking for very, very highly resolved, uh, very, very precise measurements of things in water, we, we are interested in, in expanding the business beyond ice cores as well. So if you know of anyone or you yourself have that, let me know. Okay, um, so we've got the technical capability to analyze uh, these ice cores and what's in them. Uh, it's probably a week after I started last year, I was reading the New York Times and um, on the front page, I think on a Sunday was an article uh, about the work that was going on here in our uh, ice lab. And I think, you know, it had been submitted before I got here, but it was published then. And it was really interesting. It was work that Joe and his colleagues did here and then um, interacted with a number of um, geochemists, volcanologists, and historians 
to try to look at the bigger impact of what they were seeing in the ice. So I'm going to try and run you through that extremely quickly uh, here. Okay, this is very uh, probably too much information on one image, but I'll just show a few things. What we've got at the top here are years, and this is uh, BCE. Uh, 43 BC is when something happened, and we'll get into that in a second. This was just a few years after, um, or one year actually, after the Ides of March. So if you know how uh, Julius Caesar was assassinated or you've seen the Shakespeare play, right? This is, this is that time, right? Things were uh, a bit um, shaky in Rome at that time in the Republic, and a number of different uh, things were going on. On the environmental side, uh, Nile River failures, now what that means is the Nile was known for flooding its banks every year and flooding a lot of the Delta, making very rich fertile soil, did not happen um, this year, about 48 BC, nor did it happen in 43 or 42 BC. Uh, bad harvest and, China, and uh, famine were reported in China in different records, you can see right there and a number of other things are going on. Um, if you look at the tree ring record from around um, Europe, yeah, this is Europe. Things got very, very cold right at 43 BC. Things dropped off in some places as much as about 13 degrees Fahrenheit, led to crop failures, led to uh, flooding in some other areas, a lot of rain. Um, these were the second and eighth coldest summers of over a 2,500 year period. This was the fourth coldest decade of the past 2,500 years. So some big political and societal changes going on, uh, also some big temperature changes. If we go to the ice core and look at what's going on, um, one of the things that we're measuring, and there's three different things, we'll just start with sulfur. Um, there was a sulfur peak observed here, was not observed in the Greenland ice core, but in the Greenland ice core, you can see this black line, uh, very um, large anomaly in the sulfur content, and then it drops away over a few years after that. Now, sulfate in the atmosphere is, is often associated with volcanoes. What is directly associated with volcanoes, though, would be uh, what we call tephra, which is kind of a um, solidified ash. Okay, and little, small particles of that are lofted in the atmosphere by the volcano, circle or globe a few times, and then get deposited with the snow. Large particles and medium particles were found in this core. You can see the lines on those, a real spike in the large particles right there. They drop out pretty quickly. The medium particles are down here in the uh, darker blue. They go up a little bit and then back down. Um, so a number of clues here as to what was going on. And the first question was, well, this looks like a volcanic eruption may have been responsible for the temperature change. And maybe some of these uh, famines are around the earth and usually uh, uh, flows in the Nile, things like that. The question then is which volcano did that? And this is where some other colleagues, uh, Ireland and Alaska came in. They were able to get um, go to this volcano that was suspected, and that is uh, Okmuk right here in the Aleutian Islands. Get some samples from that, were able to analyze those, and then say they look geochemically or chemically extremely similar, basically right on top of each other from the particles that were found in the ice core. So could have been a couple other uh, potential volcanoes causing that issue. Wasn't the case, it was this one in the Aleutians and that pretty much nailed that down, okay? The Roman uh, Republic didn't do so well in the next 20 years or so. <laughs> Things kind of went downhill. Battle of Alexandria, uh, Mark Antony was, was driven out. Mark Antony and Cleopatra uh, did themselves in other, diff other different things. And the Roman Empire came into existence uh, shortly after that. Now, this isn't saying that volcanic eruption made that happen, but certainly it looks like that volcanic eruption was responsible for some of the crop failures and cold temperatures. And there was already political unrest uh, within the uh, Republic that may have hastened along some of the changes that happened. So. It's a great article. Uh, if you want, start with the New York Times one. We've got it here. Um, if you want further, you can read some of the papers that have uh, come out of this and been published. Okay, could go on on that, but I'll stop there. 
One thing I would add, though, right here, is we live in a very connected world. You don't think a volcano in the Aleutians is going to impact Roman civilization. But in fact, that looks like that was exactly what was happening and was part of the reason for those changes. Um, what happens on the physical side is when you put sulfate particles into the atmosphere from a volcano, they tend to reflect a lot of sunlight, right? And that cools the earth down, okay, until they fall back out of the atmosphere. So if you're reading the news now and you're hearing the term geoengineering, there's a lot of things that could be geoengineering, but the one that's usually top of the list is to, um, as humans, not use a volcano, but to inject sulfate particles ourselves into the atmosphere to help cool the earth off. Um, it, it's proven that that will cool the earth off, but that cooling has, as the Romans found out, other, um, other side effects that, that certainly we need to keep an open mind about. All right, two more examples, microplastics and uh, agriculture. Uh, nice picture of Lake Tahoe here, looks like a beautiful place and it is, I'm very happy to be living near there again. Um, but one thing that was uh, found in Lake Tahoe just fairly recently, a couple of years ago, um, was um, the presence of microplastics. And if, if you ask what are microplastics, they are plastic particles that are less than five millimeters, about the size of a uh, pencil eraser, uh, but bigger than one uh, micrometer, uh, which is, is quite small. So going from about pencil eraser size down to certainly microscopic. Um, and there's some pieces of them right there. And if you think about it, plastics have been designed to, you know, thousands of uses. We use them in, in almost everything. They've also been designed or, or turned out to be extremely durable. So they may break apart and wear down to small pieces, but they don't go away very quickly or very easily. So why would we study these? Uh, we're interested in where they are in the environment. We're interested in where they're coming from and finding out if they're harming um, different components of the ecosystem um, in the outdoors. This is work led by uh, Monica Arienzo here at DRI and her team, and they've been quite busy recently. This is a um, little picture they put together um, just to show how microplastics may uh, enter and interact in the environment. Uh, atmospheric deposition, just like in the ice cores that we talked about, um, snowpack accumulates, that melts, they run off, get into the streams and lakes, can bioaccumulate in fish as those microscopic particles are um, consumed, or in the sediment. Um, we create them in our residences uh, as our tires wear out, those rubber particles um, also qualify as microplastics. And they get worn down just from bigger plastics being on the beach or other places. So I think you can kind of understand um, how that's happening. Um, the work that was done a couple of years ago at Lake Tahoe, six different sampling locations um, and different microplastics were found. You can see the different types here, uh, polypropylene, rayon, polycarbonate, and polyethylene, and some of the uh, more common sources of those different plastics. So certainly we see a variety of microplastic sources uh, to Lake Tahoe. I think looking at those almost anywhere on earth, um, you would say, yeah, those are prevalent as well and maybe sources. What becomes really interesting when you're working with microscopic particles is how do you know it's plastic and not maybe a mineral or a piece of clay or something else? And the way we do that is using a, a brand new and very fancy um, microscope um, that is able to look at um, reflectance of different way, wavelengths of light on those and identify those plastics. So what you're seeing here is in the microscope and this grid is about hundred microns across. So that's roughly the width of a human hair uh, from there to there. And you can see some of the microplastics that are maybe that size, or in fact, this one that's, that's quite a bit smaller. Now, when I think of microplastics, or when I used to think of them this way, it was just small pieces of maybe a cup or a um, tennis shoe or something like that that are broken down. What you see with this fiber is, is something I hadn't really thought about previously. And that is that 
we as a society wear a lot of plastics now, right? Much more than we used to, right? A lot of fleece jackets that are made from uh, different plastics. And when those break down, those very uh, small fibers are released into the environment. That's the kind of thing you could easily imagine, right? This is on the order of a 10th or a fifth, the width of a human hair. You could easily imagine that being suspended in the atmosphere for quite a bit of time. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, one of the things that we're doing right now is, is working with um, our citizen science program. And again, I would encourage people to look into this and join this. It's an app on your phone. There's a number of different um, questionnaires, depending on which project you're looking at, microplastics, LG Watch. Is it raining or snowing at the elevation and the location I am right now in this storm? We're trying to figure out that rain snow boundary in the Sierras um, and some other stuff. Uh, that's a good way to get involved. Um, when we started to realize that clothing um, could be a big source of microplastics, we have designed a dryer vent system that will catch more of those. Um, and this is with the League to Save Lake Tahoe. We've done some computational fluid dynamics modeling to look at how those particles would be lofted or deposited as they come out of a dryer. And um, one of the surveys that we had on the uh, citizen science was asking people, what are they drying? How long are they drying it for? What are the biggest pieces that they have in their dryer to get an idea of what that source might be for microplastics. So I will end that. Here's the microplastic sampling team on a rainy day at Lake Tahoe <laughs> and some of the sponsors uh, of this work. Um, I've got one more example. I will go through that pretty quickly and then we will finish up. This is the idea of evapotranspiration. And let me just explain what that is. When we get rainfall on the land surface, there's a couple things that can happen. If that water ponds or it's a lake, something like that, that water evaporates into the atmosphere. If it's um, feeding uh, plants, that's the idea of transpiration. So plants are pulling moisture out of the soil, releasing that into the atmosphere, not uh, dissimilar from the way that humans, we sweat and release uh, moisture to the atmosphere. Now, other rainfall, if there's too much, it may run off into a canal like this flooded canal you see here, or obviously it may also infiltrate into the ground and recharge the groundwater. So when you look at a hydrologic basin and you're trying to balance how much water is coming in, how much is going out, how much can I put on my crops at a given time, it's really this combination of evaporation and transpiration that has been the most difficult to estimate. So we don't, we don't try to do those separately. Usually we put that together in a single term of evapotranspiration and figure out what is that moisture loss from the land surface to the atmosphere. We can do that very similar to how we uh, calculated eddy. Uh, we take, uh, weather forecast information, as well as satellite information, especially satellite information on the ground surface temperature, and put that together and can estimate what that ET value is. And there's different ways to do that. Um, this has been a, again, multi-year partnership with a uh, diverse set of partners here, uh, Google Earth Engine, um, NASA, and the Environmental Defense Fund. So this has been built to, um, work extremely well in the cloud, um, Google's cloud in this case. It's really been just massive amounts of data coming off satellites uh, that we have to put together and, and uh, weather forecasts and put that together in a way that makes it almost instantaneous for the users, right? So it's really been a lot of um, computer science uh, program development to move the data to the algorithms, uh, or I'm sorry, move the algorithms to the data because the data become so large that we can't uh, move those. Um, we can do this. We can estimate evapotranspiration for the Western US. Um, that looks good. This helps um, very large scale studies. But if you're a farmer, you want to know how much water am I losing for my crops today on my field? And we have gone and digitized um, pretty much every agricultural field boundary in the Western US at this point. Uh, and that's what you see there. So this was um, cumulative. Um, evapotranspiration, I think in 2019, uh, from zero to 47 inches at every individual farm field. On the web tool, you're able to zoom into individual fields uh, very quickly. 
we're looking at the one that you see highlighted right here. And as you click on that or even hover over it, it's giving you, in this case, the monthly um, evapotranspiration water loss in inches um, for that field. That field is planted in this case with almonds and it's 73 acres. And if you click on any of these fields, you get something similar. This has become extremely useful for the state of California as they have moved their legislation to a new uh, groundwater, sustainable groundwater management act. Um, understanding again that loss on the upper layer, the top boundary of the, of the soil is, is key for making that work. Um, just one other example, this is, I think this might be the same field. They planted almonds. Takes a while for the almond trees to mature, as you can see, right? And then they have a uh, summertime peak in the evapotranspiration as well. Um, oh, sorry. We run a number of different models that have been developed all over the world to calculate that. You can pick whichever one you want. Um, you can use an ensemble of models, different things. I'll just uh, finish up with this helps uh, development of realistic water budgets. Uh, like I said, as there are different incentives or maybe even water markets that drive conservation and innovation, this is another component of that. Um, and it gives you proper credit for reducing your use. If you're not irrigating, you're not losing as much water in the atmosphere, you're able to quantify that. You can see some of the other things there. So um, I'm just going to do one, well, one more thing, genomic health. This is a new direction for DRI over the last couple of years. We have uh, partnered with Renown Healthcare here in uh, Northern Nevada. Uh, Renown has offered free genetic screening to, I think, about 50,000, 60,000 people now. And we work with them on that data set to do a number of things. And that's looking at genetic markers for um, various cancers or um, things like high cholesterol that might be genetically driven. What's exciting for me in, in our hydrologic sciences division is that we are starting to look at both environmental factors like arsenic and groundwater and um, genetic factors that are available in this database to see if we're finding combinations of those two that are, are causing critical issues. So that's a fairly new uh, project. I'm gonna skip over the AI one. I'll just say a little bit, here's some of our funding, um, FY20, you see where that comes from. Um, one thing that we are, are very proud of and wanna make sure everyone knows is that we are a economic engine for the state. So for every dollar that is provided by the state of Nevada, we generate nearly five more dollars um, from other sources. So. <clears throat> Total there of $5.82. And um, been doing that for nearly 60 years at this point. So really uh, wanna make sure people are aware of that. Um, we work with small companies. We like uh, small business innovation research grants. Uh, other things we've spun off a couple, uh, three companies, well, maybe two here recently, uh, two biomics looking at um, crop health, antifungal solutions, water start, which is basically bringing uh, water technology companies from around the world to apply their technologies in Nevada, finding uh, opportunities to do that. And then a bit on the uh, Institute for Health Innovation that I just started, or that I just talked about. Okay, with that, I will finish. And if there are any questions at this point, be happy to take those. This is a picture of one of our buildings in Las Vegas. Hey, Sean, uh, on the plastic side of things with microplastics, you had a list of the different plastics, you know, that you guys are finding. Um, have you cataloged what types of plastics you're finding the most of so we can address that in terms of waste uh, coming out of the different products that we're using? Yeah, yeah, good question. And that's exactly what we're in the process of doing now. We got that uh, expensive, fancy new microscope fairly recently, and it's... <laughs> It's taken us a while to get the hang of it, um, but we're now you know, spinning up to the point where we can do a number of samples quickly. The real, the real um, challenge there, and I think this is a great AI uh, challenge or opportunity, is to be able to look at you know, larger pieces of plastics and confirm very quickly without having to go through the, the laboratory process what kind of plastic they are. 
we, we think if we get enough of the microplastics in the microscope correctly labeled, we may be able to start bringing it out and you know, estimating with some accuracy what they are without having to go to the microscope. We'll see. <laughs> um, somebody on chat had a question. Uh, does the total moisture content in the atmosphere change over time and why? Yes. Uh, that <laughs> Could be a longer answer. Um, warmer air, if you remember kind of basic physics, warmer air holds more moisture, right? So, so if the atmosphere is, is generally hotter than it used to be, its ability to hold moisture goes up. Now, we were talking about this today and, you know, you say climate change, that becomes a very loaded uh, topic. What I like to think though, is if we are changing our atmosphere such that it can hold more energy, that may be in heat, right? They're going to hold more water. What we're seeing here is some in the West is really some feedback between the land surface and that hotter atmosphere that is allowing it to pull more water out of the ground. What we're seeing in other parts of the country, maybe on the East, is that <laughs> more uh, saturated atmosphere, if you will, resulting in more violent uh, downpours or larger downpours in some of the storms. So it's kind of different sides of the same um, coin really that we're seeing in different parts of the country. But the answer is yes. Don, I have a question for you. Yep. Uh, I'd like to stay on that EDDI evaporate the band index. Um, so is there a direct correlation between the uh, EDDI and say glacier melting or formation? Uh, yeah, good question. Not one that we have directly looked at. We don't, and, and that's, I don't even know if you could calculate EDDI in a glacial um, setting because it's really targeted for soil. I'm just gonna flip back there and look at that global picture. Um, and the fact that you're, you're moving over um, lots of snow is, is probably generally putting quite a bit of moisture into the lower atmosphere, so it's a little more humid. Um, just trying to get back to see if... <laughs> if uh, I uh, turned off your screen share, and you'll have to reshare it. Um, yeah, let me just see if I can make sense of that. I'm just trying to get back to it. Um, that would be different, and I don't think that's something we, we've tested. Yeah, I'm just looking at Greenland right now. I can put that up there. Um, a lot of that is looking like it's neither positive or negative in, in the atmospheric demand off of the ice sheet. Um, a bit of it's a little more humid. Um, I would guess too, the satellites are generally tuned to give us better coverage in the mid latitude. So that might be a little bit difficult to do up there. Um, I'm gonna ask our experts on that though. I'm, I'm not the expert on that one. <laughs> Thanks, that was a good question. Hey, Sean, we have another one on chat. Um, Barbara Derrickson is asking if you guys are going to bring back the green box science kits. And uh, if so, will you be making more of them available? Um, the plan is to bring those back, keep those going. Um, they're, you know, everything we do takes funding and, and sometimes there are disruptions in that, but that is the plan. On making more of them available, I, it sounds like maybe asking for there to be newer um, lessons or newer uh, green boxes that go with that. I don't know the answer to that, but I, I can certainly find out. It, it, it seems to me like that one might be a good public-private type of partnership or maybe a uh, partnership with someone like the Bill Gates Foundation. Have you guys ever explored that? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I don't know about the Gates Foundation, but I think a lot of that has been funded by private foundations. Um, mm -hmm. We are um, working right now with a con congressional a bid to get some additional funding for that. And that, that one in particular may be targeted at Southern Nevada. Stay tuned and we'll see how it goes. Okay. I, I have an observation for what it's worth. Um, you know, we, we've all been encouraged uh, to uh, carry these uh, non-woven polypropylene grocery bags and that type of thing, because they supposedly can be recycled. But after listening to your discussion on microplastics, um, at the same time, aren't we 
uh, although we feel good <laughs> about doing something like that, uh, it is contributing to the whole microplastics problem. Is that true? I, yeah, <laughs> I think you're right. I, I think when I think about the plastic problem, the thing that, that I've certainly tried to reduce in my life are those very short lived single use plastics, you know, a, a lid on a drink or a, a plastic cup or a, a plastic grocery bag, just like you said. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the obvious thing to do. And I think moving to a multi-use uh, bag, even, even if that is plastic, I think is, is going to be better than getting a new plastic bag every time you go. Even better would be to get something with cloth, right? A denim uh, or some other cloth uh, grocery bag that could be used multiple times. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll ask them if uh, woven uh, polypropylene shopping bags or something that has, has shown up on the list. I've got another chat question, and it's kind of along the lines of what Bill just asked about. But, um, you know, recycled plastics are used a lot in clothing um, with people like Patty, Patagonia using them in a big way. Um, number one is, does it help to hang dry rather than using a dryer with those products so they don't break down as quickly? And then have you guys ever talked about partnering with how to produce recycled products such as clothing? Um, in ways that, that maybe don't break down? Um, yeah, yeah, good ideas as well. We, we have not gotten that far. Uh, I, I like the idea of air drying, though. I think you're absolutely right that they won't break down as fast and they won't put microplastics out there. But trying to, working with a clothing manufacturer to design those differently, we, we, we are not there yet. <laughs> well, we'll put that one in the future, though. I like that. Sure. Um, Dave just asked, how do you trim the sides off the ice cores and how do you avoid contaminating them in that process? Yeah. And that's a, that's a trade secret. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to kill us uh, if you told yeah. us. <laughs> Honestly, I don't, I don't know the exact mechanism there. That's something Joe has worked out. Um, if you, some of you have been, I think in Joe's lab and you walk in there and your first your first impression is this guy is a tinkerer, right? I mean, it is instrumentation, wires, cables going everywhere. And I mean, he has come up with some really ingenious techniques to uh, get what he needs and very well done. So I, I, I'm sure he's got that figured out. Mm -hmm. it, may, it may be a hot wire um, of a non-reactive metal. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure of that. So, so these ice cores, I, I, I've seen some different shows on ice cores and I'm curious, how do you guys determine the, the age of the samples coming out of those ice cores? In other words, you're saying that there was, you know, high particulates in the air of, of sulfur-based materials. Um, how do you know when that happened? Yeah, so there's a couple of different techniques for that. One is, you know, very much like tree ring counting, just kind of going back and being able to get maybe not just a visual, but also a chemical kick that occurs seasonally. Um, but the other one then is, is just dating using different uh, chemicals. So carbon data. dating? Yeah, with carbon might be a little too far back for some of the stuff we're looking at, but other, other isotopic or other chemical means of doing that. Okay. And then let's see. So uh, somebody else listed something. So with using the filters on the dryer, how would the lint be di disposed of to reduce it ending up back in the water system again? <laughs> yeah, very good question, right? <laughs> you can catch it, but then, uh, yeah, you still got it. So what, what do you do with it? And uh, I would have to ask Monica what her recommendation is on that right now. But um, yeah, you know, how do you, <laughs> burial would be one, <laughs> one, you know, get it in a landfill or something like that, but you want to make sure it ends up there. Um, yeah, good question. I'll ask uh, to... Anna, Dave, is there a way we can, uh, if, if Sean gets us answers to some of those questions, that we can uh, put that out there so people can see it on our website? Yes. And in fact, um, everybody who attended registered, so we can also email to everyone whatever answers we have. Yeah, that sounds great. That would be interesting. Yep. I will uh, work on that. Yeah. Give me a few days. But, uh, and, sure. and don't rush on that because uh, obviously we can email it out whenever you have the information ready. So. Uh, Take your time. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, anything else? Well, thanks everyone for uh, coming and uh, learning about some of the stuff we do at DRI. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, being able to present this and uh, it was fun putting together the uh, pres presentation to give to you. Yeah, it's, it's great to have such a great organization like DRI in Northern Nevada. You know, it, I, for me, it makes me proud to be in Nevada and knowing that we're doing such great things with research, you know, here in the area. Oh, cool. That's really, uh, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, and I, I think um, the other thing I would say to this crowd, you know, if you got some wild idea for business or something you need, you know, give us a call. We, uh, as I said, we are self-funded, right? We have to go after things. So we're very agile and aggressive in, in going after uh, new ideas and funding sources for those. So we, and we like working with the local community.